Uh, even if in the audience most of the people know what uh, is uh, uh, what are reactive oxygen species and reactive uh, nitrogen species, I wish to make a first uh, series of slides to really speak about what I am speaking of and what I am not speaking of, okay? Because sometimes it's very confusing. So in the originally the problem of oxidative stress uh, came uh, essentially because of the atomic bombing in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, people realized that uh, a lot of people have been killed by the bombing, but many other people have been killed afterward uh, here. And uh, that uh, also with what has happened to people like uh, the family Curie and so on, with a lot of cancer, people realize that when you have these uh, high radiations, uh, UV radiations, okay, so sometimes is good, but not too much, okay, and ra uh, radiation rays like uh, are emitted during the radioactivity, you can have the splitting of the water molecule, and that generates the radical OH dot. So it's basically what it is done in pulse radiolysis. And now this uh, OH dot radical is generated from the water, so it's generated statistically at every place in the cell, and there is not a special uh, place where it is uh, uh, generated, it's just a probabilistic event. And uh, when it is uh, near, since the bound OH in the water molecule is the strongest bound that involves hydrogen in organic chemistry, and uh, because of that, OH dot is able to abstract hydrogen atoms from any biomolecule. So we know, uh, for example, I was speaking about cancer, any uh, problem with the DNA, but also with the proteins that are reading the DNA or making functions, but also with the lipids of the, that protect the cell, uh, that are the cell membranes, so that creates problems. For example, that may be an issue for a lot of uh, disease like Alzheimer, for example, uh, you have plenty of damage. But this is related to this guy, uh, which is generated here at one point in the cell and will eat immediately on anything which is not water here. So that means that this guy cannot uh, survive for a long time. So he will kill. Uh, and if it does not uh, find the means of generating a, a radical chain carrier, uh, that will transport the radical process. In fact, that will die very uh, quickly, and fortunately for us, okay? So, but for a long time, people have been thinking exclusively in terms of OH rad dot radical, and evidently in chemistry, people say, haha, I know a way to generate OH dot radical from hydrogen peroxide. This is a Fenton reaction. So, from this OH dot radical, which is coming from the I would say, radioactive uh, view, uh, we shifted to the Fenton reaction. But now, a Fenton reaction, it needs that you have hydrogen peroxide, this is, tr uh, this is true, but it needs also that you have a catalyst. And this catalyst, you, as you know, are transition metal uh, like uh, iron and so on, okay? And those transition metal in the life, in the biology, they are sequestrated to avoid the Fenton reaction. So unless you have problems with the sequestration of these metals, the Fenton uh, reaction is highly improbable, except in very some <coughs> specific place where you have a lot of iron, like nucleus, for example. But mm -hmm. hydrogen peroxide should not go easily to the nucleus of the cell. So that, when I started in this area, was really puzzling me, and I wondered uh, what it is really this oxidative stress. How comes that everybody is relating to OH dot, and so the probability to have OH dot is extremely small even if it is very, very reactive. And in fact, uh, we have uh, a power uh, central uh, to generate our energy, and this one is uh, working on the oxidative stress. So for example, this is a mitochondria, and the mitochondria, if you look the membrane here, I, uh, in between the inner compartment and the outer inner membrane and the outer membrane uh, here, this guy is getting, uh, he is working like my car, okay, he's getting uh, carbohydrates or I would say CH bond, okay, and uh, we generate carbon dioxide, okay, and in this process we generate electrons that are carried 
to a, se a sequence of uh, proteins that are uh, using these electrons to drive protons out from the inside to this uh, inner compartment here. Uh, and in this inner compartment, this proton gradient will uh, be building up and that will be used then uh, to transform ADP, which is missing here, into ATP, which is uh, energy, uh, energy currency in the cells. So, but uh, sometimes um, there is uh, not enough ADP, for example, like here, hmm? and the, then it cannot uh, work this way, and uh, you have to release this gradient here, and you do it by uh, using the electrons to make superoxide from oxygen that will be converted ultimately in, into water. So this is already one source of the, of the oxidative stress. Uh, also, if one of these enzymes is impaired for some reason, the mitochondria will call uh, the nucleus. It is said that it, this is uh, by sending messengers that are uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive ni nitrogen species, but is, uh, it's something which is uh, very ambiguous because we don't know really what are those messengers. But anyway, if the mitochondria does not receive uh, uh, the corresponding protein from the nucleus, uh, it will uh, decide that the cell is impaired and it will decide to kill the cell by generating caspase and caspase will uh, uh, start the beginning of apoptosis. Apoptosis will amount to cleave the cell into uh, little compartment. Here you see this was a macrophage, you will see macrophage after, is uh, cleaved, its membrane start to be uh, completely cleaved, even the nucleus is cleaved and so on, and the cell will be completely dis disappearing, dismantled into the unit components that will be digested by macrophage. And this is basically what is happening in Alzheimer, okay, uh, with the neurons of the people who are Alzheimer. And uh, so it's a big issue to understand what uh, makes this uh, beginning of the apoptosis. And another place where this oxidative stress is very useful for our organism is to protect ourselves. So this is the uh, basic level, I would say, the fireman of the organism. These are the macrophage, okay? And uh, th this is a nice macrophage, I would say, like uh, orchids when they are 18. <laughs> And that is when they register in the army and sent in Afghanistan, for example, okay? <laughs> so they receive training here. Uh, biologically, this is, uh, for example, by interferon gamma and LPS that makes the macrophage believe that they are ter <coughs> terrorists around, around. So he will go and try to catch this terrorist with this big uh, extension of the cytoskeleton that makes extension of the membrane and it will generate these vesicles and for example you can see here what uh, this is taken from the internet okay one macrophage has uh, smell the candida albicans and it start to wrap around the candida albicans up to the point where he has completely wrapped the uh, poor bacteria inside okay and when he does that on its membrane, he has two essential devices, uh, a pool of NADPH oxidase, a pool of innocentase. When he wraps around here, he will create a vacuole, which is uh, called phagolysosome, okay? And this is activated by calcium. At this moment, NADPH oxidase will generate superoxide. Innocentase will generate nitric oxide. And that will make uh, an incredible cocktail that will kill uh, uh, the bacteria by cutting the bacteria into pieces up to the point it is digested. So that explains why we have maintained. First, we breathe oxygen. Okay, so again, if I take like as example of my car, when I am in my car, I have uh, an engine and a tank of gas. Okay, if uh, I cannot control, if my engine cannot control uh, finally how the gas is uh, given to the engine to power the car, everything could blow, okay? Uh, you can go to your favorite gunster movie and you will see what uh, is the energy coming out of your car when you are not controlling the system. So the system is controlled uh, in our body by many uh, things that we, you have only to open a magazine and you will see all this anti radicals business, okay? Uh, so for once, advertising is not really telling the, 
uh, wrong things, okay? Uh, fortunately, uh, most of them we eat and they go away about the same way as uh, they have entered, okay? So uh, we do not uh, make uh, a real uh, mess in our system, okay? So, by the way, all the business about the vitamin C uh, that uh, twice Nobel Prize uh, was using uh, at high concentration uh, does not work, absolutely, because uh, vitamin C is uh, controlled in your blood to remain at uh, not beyond the value, which is a normal value you get when you eat oranges and so on. So every pill of vitamin C that you take, like I'm doing in the morning, okay, uh, is going away. The, uh, the stuff was uh, made for injection of vitamin C in the blood, which is completely different, okay? It has not been filtered by the guts and so on. So all these uh, here, carotenoids, uh, you have enzyme like a catalase, uh, molecule, glutathione and so on, vitamins, all these things are here to equilibrate uh, the good thing, the good and the bad, like in the title of the, this thing. So when the good and the bad are equilibrated, this is called homeostasis and uh, we are perfect. Now, if we don't have enough of the oxidative stress, we are impaired and, for example, our macrophage will not be able to get rid of the bacteria and, for example, uh, you know that uh, what happens, for example, this is uh, when the macrophage are impaired, this is, for example, what happens when you have AIDS. Hmm? So, on the other hand, if you make too much of them, they will create problems and that uh, result in a lot of uh, illness. So, it's very delicate and it's very important that we understand what it is, this thing, and how it works. Because uh, for a long time, the biologists and the medical people were just calling reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, okay? But what were these people? It was very hard to understand. So, uh, Many years ago, we decided with my friend Monique Guillaume to develop, uh, to apply the methods that uh, Mark Whiteman and myself uh, introduced for the detection of uh, neurotransmitter release that I call the artificial synapse. Why it is uh, I call it artificial synapse? Because in the synapse, you have the neuron that is releasing a very small amount of molecule into the cleft. And here you have the receptors. So now, because the, this volume is very small, the actual concentration of neurotransmitter in the cleft is very high, and so the probability is that one neurotransmitter hits one receptor is extremely high. So with Mark, uh, we adopted this method uh, uh, by bringing an electrode onto a living cell, so the electrode will collect everything which is electroactive. And here, for example, you have it uh, in the case with the electrode is uh, put over a macrophage that has been activated. And this is what we see. For example, this is one of these vesicles here emptying into the extracellular fluid. So in this thing, you have a lot of noise because you have 10,000 molecules. Okay? So this is very critical. And here, it is uh, at the level where we catch the peroxynitrate, okay? So this is peroxynitrate or hydrogen peroxide. But because of the, this uh, species that are born out of the superoxide and the nitric oxide, so superoxide will lead by disproportionation to hydrogen peroxide, or it can react couple with, uh, extremely fast with uh, nitric oxide to give you peroxynitrate, and this one can go out or decompose into nitrite and nitrates, okay? And uh, it can also, nitric oxide can also diffuse. So in fact, formally we get, uh, in all the release, we get these uh, people. At longer time, this one will be able to undergo a lot of reaction with uh, <laughs> carbon dioxide, uh, with uh, 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 thiols and all these things. But what is important is at the beginning, when we look at uh, this thing, uh, we have, uh, with this uh, platinized carbon electrode, we have definite uh, voltammograms for each of the four species. So by making uh, measurement on uh, statistically uh, significant series of cells at the four potential, one here, which is close to the top of the hydrogen peroxide wave, but still the bottom of the peroxynitrite, one here, which is 
on the top of the two, on the plateaus of the two uh, of this one, then here on the plateau of the nitric oxide and one here on the nitrate, <coughs> we can reconstruct uh, each of the components here and then we can reconstruct how much of superoxide was here and how much of nitric oxide here. So for example, for the same macrophage that I showed before, statistically, so now is not a noisy curve and so on, you can uh, see <coughs> that these macrophages are producing nitric oxide and superoxide ion uh, approximately the same amount, okay? So in most of the cells that we have been investigated, we have found that. So each time the two production are almost equivalent. So some cells make more of both, some cells make less of both, but generally it's always like if the two systems are coupled. Now, uh, one of the things is when this macrophage, as you have seen, he has these vesicles, it has been argued in the literature that maybe uh, when he has these vesicles, some of the oxidative stress uh, species, so some of these reactive species and, uh, can diffuse out and be inside of the macrophage. And this is an issue uh, which is not uh, completely idiot because uh, nitric oxide can diffuse through membranes, okay? So you can expect that if the uh, phagosome is limited by its own membrane, nitric oxide can uh, diffuse out. Peroxynitrite is an anion. It should not diffuse out uh, into a membrane, which is lipidic, but its PKA is 6.8. As a result, it can protonate very easily and diffuse uh, out uh, because one of the form of the protonated forms is uh, lipophilic and can diffuse uh, out of the membrane. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, it will be more difficult. Nit uh, nitrite ions, they will not diffuse, okay? So the question that was raised in the biological and medical literature was not uh, a silly question, but the big problem was uh, in order to investigate uh, inside of the cell and not outside of the cell when here we investigate when the vesicle is opening uh, to these vesicle are opening to the outer world so we we needed to make uh, very very small electrode and for that we collaborated with uh, Mark Mirkin in Colombia in New York and uh, here you have uh, so we needed uh, basically if you look to this electrode uh, but now you think it's nano electrode you make a little uh, well here by attacking the platinum. This is, is split platinum. And th this well is perfectly defined here. And then you will grow black platinum inside of this thing. And here you see, for example, an AFM. This is a black platinum coming out uh, of the well. And now this electrode, you can enter, uh, you can, uh, for example, here on this uh, classical horse of the uh, electrochemistry, you have the beautiful curve here for the reduction of uh, ruthenium. You enter into the cell, uh, since the electrode is small, the cell seals. No ruthenium can fill in the cell, so you have no current. And now you pop up uh, the electrode out of the cell and you get the green curve here. So it means that uh, you can enter the cell, okay, uh, with these electrodes that are different from those of Mirkin uh, in the past, uh, because they have this black platinum, and the black platinum uh, is not really affected by this transfer, and presumably this is when it's going out that uh, we are losing a part of the reaction. So now, uh, for example, what is important is to compare what we can measure inside of the cell compared to outside. So this is one of the signals, for example, outside of the cell here. Uh, at this potential, you get uh, uh, all the, the, the species, hydrogen peroxide, peroxide nitrate, nitric oxide, and uh, nitrate ions, okay? So outside, this is what I shown before. You see, you have a very huge uh, uh, curve with a, a large quantity, but inside now, we get very small curves, okay? So you can, uh, is about one, one twentieth to one, uh, nearly uh, one hundredth of the one th that is shown outside. And you have a rising uh, here, okay? In those, those are two typical curves, but you have a rising period. And immediately after this rising, 
you have a kind of exponential uh, tail, and this exponential tail is the same as this one, which shows that the macrophage is able to detect immediately that something has been leaking out <coughs> and is cleaning it out. So that uh, shows why uh, people were having this hypothesis, but nobody could report that inside of the macrophage you had a huge oxidative stress, because presumably the macrophage does like a poor plumber, okay? Uh, you make a poor plumbing, you have leaks, but you clean these leaks, okay, very quickly. Uh, so, uh, from that, uh, I will shift to a, a case in which oxidative stress is important. And this is the application uh, to bond maintenance. Uh, I don't know what you know about bonds, but uh, if you know as much as I was knowing before uh, uh, becoming interested to this, uh, that was just the bones, is a piece of stone that we have <laughs> in our bodies that holds us, okay? And is a kind of flexible stone because uh, of the protein inside. So that was basically what I was knowing about the bones, okay? So basically that, okay? And uh, here you have the mineral part of the bond here, and this is the tissue. So uh, here where the mineral part is mixed with organic part, and by your bioorganic part that uh, gives uh, the possibility that the bond, for example, uh, if my bonds were really uh, in the calcium phosphate uh, the of the matrix, if I just do like this, my bond will simply split apart and uh, I will fall on the ground. That will please many people, but uh, this is not the purpose of this talk, okay? So I was uh, told that uh, all this uh, organic material which is here is a kind of glue and uh, 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 make a kind of a spring to absorb the, the notion. But in fact it's more complicated than that. Because this notion that the bond will uh, break is, is, ex is exactly true. Our bonds are never the same. So each time I am moving here, uh, you are sitting, you are breaking your bones in your ankles and so on, you are making lit lit little cracks. These little cracks will activate cells that will immediately reconstruct the bone locally, okay? And this is the way we can have the feeling that we have a skeleton which is uh, same ske skeleton, but in fact we are rebuilding this skeleton. It's like uh, this convention center. If you want people destroying the walls and in continuous uh, reconstructing it, so in uh, 300 years from now, it will be brand new. Hmm? If you let this thing this way, if you come in 50 years, you will see a bunch of uh, concrete uh, and ruins, okay? So, uh, basically we have three kind of cells that operate in that. The osteoblast, that secrete, uh, secrete the osteoids, so which is the, the material uh, for the bone matrix, and they begin the min mineralization. So these are the cells that are constructing the bone. Now you have the osteoclast, that are the people who are degrading the bone. Because, in fact, when you construct the bone, think of this wall. If you have people who are building this wall in continuous, there will be always some smart people that think that uh, maybe the wall should be thicker, okay? And start to make a thicker wall. But then this will create a problem for other things. So these cells feel the pressure of the matrix, bone matrix, and when they feel this pressure, they decide to degrade the bone. Okay, and uh, in fact, when uh, women have osteoporosis, is a big problem because that is still active, but this one uh, starts to be not active because it's under control of hormones, and this is why uh, older women with osteoporosis, they have the bones that uh, start to be with, uh, like, uh, uh, Brittle. In French, is dentelle, okay? Brittle, 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 and uh, but they look like with a li uh, lot of holes, yeah, like uh, you know this kind of tissue that women use for bras, okay? <laughs> which are uh, full of holes, yeah. Osteoporosis. What? Osteoporosis. No, but I no, he's he's, he's trying to explain the the how the bone looks with all the holes in it. Pores. Pores. Yeah. Okay, anyway, this was not what I wanted to say, but uh, <laughs> it looks that uh, the classical American male does not know how he's made in <laughs> uh, 
Uh, oh, you're what? talking about lace? No. Lace. Yes. Yeah, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you compare a real uh, uh, tissue cloth to lace, this is about uh, my bones as compared to a woman of 70 who has osteoporosis. Okay. So you can understand that will uh, break very easily. And uh, so uh, then you need to have this balance here between the bone resorption, okay, because otherwise the bones will grow and uh, uh, that will be a cancer, okay, and uh, the bone formation here that, uh, uh, and the whole thing should be equilibrated. And to my surprise, the biologists and the medical people were saying, haha, this is, the bone formation is under the control by nitric oxide, mm -hmm. but the bone uh, resorption is under control by hydrogen peroxide. And you remember what I told you in all uh, former studies, we were always finding an equivalent proportion of superoxide and nitric oxide in any cells. So at the beginning when I read that, I said uh, there must be something different because it cannot be possible. Be all cells that we are investigating are making uh, always these uh, equal proportions. But already, uh, if you go, we studied this MG63 cells that are uh, cancer cells, bone cancer cells. Uh, they don't have the uh, NADPH oxidase. They have, uh, so already they will decrease the uh, production of superoxide. This is repla replaced by xanthase, which is uh, also producing superoxide, but to a lesser level. And they have enosynthase. So, uh, you can always think uh, a lot, but the best is to do the experiments, okay? And uh, we decided to use uh, the classical method. So, this was done with my friends uh, in the lab uh, in Xiamen, in China. So, this is a MG63 cell in this cartoon. We stimulate the cell, okay, and we measure uh, what the cell is releasing. So, here you have one of the cell here which is like this. That is the electrode, which is out of focus. The, here the electrode is pushed uh, above, and you have the pipette, which is used to stimulate the cell by creating the depolarization of the membranes to let enter calcium. And this is after the experiment, so you see that the cell has not suffered at all. Okay. And now, we, when we make the measurement, like I said uh, before, we measured uh, all the people who are coming out Okay, and when we reconstruct uh, the flux, you see already we find a very small quantity of hydrogen peroxide, two femtomoles. This is per one cell, okay, in average. And six femtomoles of uh, peroxynitrite, 17 <coughs> femtomoles for nitric oxide, and five femtomoles for nitrate. So immediately you realize that this is nitric oxide, okay, is uh, coming from the nitric oxide, and this one is coming from peroxynitrite. So so that makes a huge amount of uh, species that are coming from the production of nitric oxide. And in fact, if you uh, count back here, you will find that uh, this cell in average is sending about 30 femtomoles of nitric oxide and only 13 femtomoles of superoxide. So it is completely unbalanced uh, as compared. So now what we want to do is to investigate the over cells to see if they generate more hydrogen peroxide. If it is uh, this way, maybe uh, we can think uh, of uh, some medicine that could be, uh, because there are a lot of uh, organic uh, molecules that uh, can be used to deliver nitric oxide. So maybe we can think of some implants that we put uh, in the bones of uh, people with osteoporosis, so they will generate this nitric oxide and maybe stimulate the bone formation that cannot uh, go because of the hormonal uh, track has been uh, impaired after the uh, menopause. So, uh, on that I wanted to, to conclude, I wanted to leave, since I tried to make this uh, talk uh, rather provocative, I have left uh, some time for the discussion. And uh, I will thank the people who did uh, this work. So essentially, in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, in my laboratory, this is uh, Dr. Man uh, Manon, uh, Manon Guy, who is uh, now uh, assistant professor, and Frédéric Lemaitre, who also uh, assistant professor. 
Alaric Coe uh, is one of the most brilliant uh, postdoc I had uh, in this area of uh, uh, bio chemistry and uh, he is now back in his uh, country in Singapore. And Miss uh, Tsonglu, uh, she is, a po uh, she is a uh, uh, doing her PhD, uh, she will uh, defend her PhD in September. Like I said, uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Mike Mirkin from Queen's College uh, in New York, okay? And in her lab, uh, this person, uh, Sishian uh, Wong, we call her Connie. Uh, she is uh, on the doctor track. She is very good and she did uh, all these micro electrodes here. And uh, she learned that uh, platinum is not platinum. So that means that uh, classical platinum war and black platinum are two different things and black platinum is essential for detecting all these things, okay? Uh, Jean-Marc Noel is uh, now a postdoc in uh, Mike Mirkin and is working also on this project. And in the University of Xiamen in China, this is a joint lab uh, between my friend uh, John Chun Tian and uh, my laboratory. So this is the symbol of this uh, joint lab. And uh, it was involving Professor Jian Lin, who is now retiring, and Dr. Ren Wu, who spent a lot of time in Paris. I want to thank Academy of Science, Ecole Normale Supérieure, CNRS, the Ministry of uh, Research, and the University Pierre and Marie Curie, since my lab belongs to the University Pierre Marie Curie, ENS, and CNRS. Finally, I want to thank Susan for inviting me to come here, and all of you for uh, your kind attention. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Yes, Dave. So, how is the macrophage controlling? Yeah. You said the macrophage shows intercellularly that it seems to be reducing the oxidative stress pretty quickly. Does it do it by having an overload for the final? How does it do it? We don't know yet, we, we, because what I, uh, this part, uh, this uh, few slides that I, uh, they have, they are on a work that has been finished uh, only 10 days ago, and is submitted now to PNAS with uh, Mike Merkin. So I think to my knowledge, this is the first time somebody have, uh, can be, ab is able to quantify something in s inside of the macrophage, and uh, I, we hope that now we will be able to uh, investigate uh, that to try to understand. And in particular, I didn't say when I uh, gave my talk, but uh, here we didn't use the uh, already activated macrophage. You you remember? Uh, okay. Uh, this is uh, the normal macrophage, not activated, okay? This one is activated. So my guess was that uh, the macrophage, uh, they can eat many bacteria, okay, uh, in a row. So if they were killing themselves each time they eat bacteria, that would not be very efficient. So I am uh, thinking that uh, here already they have inside developed all the means to kill the uh, ROS and RMS, okay? So that's the reason we use the rest, uh, uh, macrophage in the rest state, and we just uh, stimulate them by depolarizing the membrane by the entrance of calcium, thinking that the macrophage, I apologize for saying this way, doesn't know that it will be uh, making oxidative stress. So what it is, is uh, fastness, to, to respond. And you can see from there, here, that he responds in less than two seconds and cleans everything, okay? So now we will try to impair this cleaning by uh, interfering with the, with the macrophage. But this is a big uh, research now. But thank you for your question. It's very important. Any other questions? We have Time for maybe one more. All right, well, thanks a lot. Thank you very much.